Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the University Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. As it says on the screen, my name is Barry London. I'm having a pretty good week. I saw a lot of people in Sanford yesterday at the Porch Fest, and I'm glad to be speaking to a lot more people today at our fellowship. I would like to begin this morning and be sure to uh, minimize your devices so that we don't have any sound in the background. I'd like to begin the service this morning with uh, uh, anybody from our committees who may wish to provide us with information this morning. Kelly, can you assist me with that? Yes, Barry, I can definitely do that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, now is the time that we're looking for our committee, our wonderful committee chairs, uh, for any fantastic or groovy announcements that you may have about your committee. Uh, what I'd like to do is to, to, uh, to ask you to raise your physical hand and I will call on you and uh, make sure you unmute yourself. So anybody have an announcement? I see Judith's hand is up. Judith, you wanna go ahead? So as you can see, I am, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. As you can see, I am at our congregation property this morning because our religious education class is actually going to meet here, which yeah. is why I'm announcing. I'm asking anyone that might not have seen the email that if you can be here by around noon, we're gonna have a class, very socially distanced, you must wear a mask. Um, and sign att health attestations, which I have on property. And there will be pre-packaged snacks and pre-bottled water, et cetera. So hope to see kids and their, and their parental responsible units with them. Well, thank you, Judith. Do you have a special activity plan for today? We're reviewing, we're reviewing the, um, the classes that we've been having this year and talking about all the different faiths uh, that we've been in touch that we've kind of had in the classroom and talked about in the classroom and then we're doing a scavenger hunt. Oh definitely don't want to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay so uh, I'm looking for other hands and let me go to the second screen. Um, I don't see anybody else. Um, I'll just chime in quickly. The parents support group meets on Sundays at 9 p.m. So if you are in charge of taking care of a little one, however you define that little one, um, <laughs> feel free to join us where we support each other and uh, share what's happening in our worlds. Well, thank you, Amanda. Okay, Marianne, I'll see your hand. Go ahead. Well, Kelly, I'm just going to turn it over to you to give <laughs> us a... Uh, final update on the food drive for second harvest. And uh, we do have a SAC meeting following here. I'll put the link in the chat, but I'm turning it over to Kelly and to Joey to give us the, the final result of our food drive with second harvest. Okay. All right. So if, if there are no other announcement from any committee chairs, then the SACS committee will go ahead and close the... Oh, oh Martha, go Actually, ahead. Anne, Anne Packham has well, her hand up. I can't see That's her. what I was going to say. Okay. Oh, I can't see her. Oh, there she is. Sorry. Sorry. I, my Wi-Fi is poor in this room. Um, okay. Uh, just want to mention the women's group is meeting Friday at noon at a park to be determined. Um, and if you don't, um, if you're not already um, getting the emails, then just email me and I'll put that in the chat if my Wi-Fi doesn't go out again. Thank you, Ann. Okay. So any other hands, physical hands? I don't see anything on the chat except for parent support and no virtual hands raised. So I guess SACS committee will go ahead and, and give an update. So um, Patrick, should I go ahead and talk now or should you show okay, the slides? Okay, okay. So I, I just wanted to, just to make a, a brief announcement that for six weeks um, we have been conducting a food drive, uh, which is fighting um, hunger and feeding hope. 
Uh, Joey Cole and I are Boots on the Ground subcommittee, and we ended yesterday. Uh, and I wanted to share, first off, a couple of thank yous for the people that showed up yesterday to help us load 1,085 pounds of food on the truck. Uh, I would like to thank Miak Buchanan, Joey Cole, Ann and Maddie Packham, Martha Kirby, Amy Mowbray for, for actually being there for us. Uh, and a special thanks to all the monetary uh, contributions that were made. We, we had some really impressive individuals that, that really donated a, quite a bit of money and we really appreciate that and all the food. Uh, so everything was really appreciated. We, we feel that this was a, a very successful event and it wouldn't be successful without our community. So a very uh, wonderful thank you. So this is the food, if you can see on the slide that we had prepared to go. Uh, and we also had baby uh, items like uh, pampers and diapers and baby food, uh, lots of canned goods, cereals, rice, oatmeal. Uh, we had it all ready to go. And then uh, when Amy showed up with the truck, uh, we delivered, that's, that's Amy and Martha. They're loading up, they're getting ready to go to second harvest. Um, and we end with Amy and Martha taking it off, taking the, and there we go, that's what we, they actually unloaded all the food. It was 1,085 pounds. We raised $2,500. And I think that I would appreciate if you, everybody could come off mute and just really just give a nice shout, clap, hands, and for everybody. Thank you. We've been trying to reach out to the community to do some, out, some outreach. And uh, we, we've done that very well. And we just want to thank everyone for all your time, talents, and treasures. Thank you. That's it. That's all the committee minutes we have for today. For today. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick and Paul, for putting those pictures together at the last minute. And I'll turn it back over to Barry, the wild, wonderful, witty service leader. Yeah. And, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is, am I muted? I don't think so. Um, we're going to be speaking today about our origins. And uh, based upon that, uh, that first time when the next child born in our family and we all sit and look about the crib and we look at the toes and we look at the eyes and we wonder if that is looks like is a resemblance to Uncle Joe or Aunt Frida or, or whoever. We're going to have an interesting talk this morning. And for opening words, I'd like to make a comment from uh, one Edward Sellner, a professor of pastoral theology and spirituality at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. We inherit from our ancestors gifts so often taken for granted. Each of us contains within this inheritance of soul. Soul can mean many different things to many people. It can mean DNA. We are links between the ages containing past and present expectations, sacred memories, and future promise. We can now turn to opening music a song I've always loved, In My Life, The Beatles. There are places I remember all my life. Things that went before I know I'll often 
stop and think about them chalice please take your match and light it i see joy prepared to do that anyone else that wishes to do so in joining us the lighting of the chalice in the light of truth and the warmth of love we gather to seek to sustain and to share And also, please join us in our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its gift. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love and to help one another. I don't know if I can't see everyone out there today, but uh, for those, if we have any visitors, I wish to extend a welcome to you. We're happy to see you here. We wish to tell you that our services, topics and speakers vary greatly uh, from today, we're talking about our ancestors and uh, tomorrow we may have somebody from one of our universities in the community uh, or from uh, visiting uh, ministers. Any number of subjects may be discussed, so we urge you to join us and to get some taste of what these services are about in our lay-led community. Joys and concerns. We would like to hear from anyone who has something to share with us that uh, has have been of great impact to them uh, and is germane to our church, our fellowship. And, uh, and we invite you at this time to uh,
who shared a joy or concern. Let us lift up what was spoken. Let us lift up what was unspoken. Let us hold that in our hearts for just a silent moment. Thank you. And now a time for all ages. And we turn to Judith Stein Farrell. Judith. Thank you, Barry. So first of all, I'm gonna say, if you have a piece of paper and pen handy, you might want to grab it because you may wanna take some notes during time for all ages. Our uh, Margie today is speaking about our personal histories and the value of them. It is the last day of uh, Black History Month. And to that, I thought I would do a short slideshow of uh, uh, the, his the Black lineage in our Unitarian Universalist history. So find the slides. There we go. Honoring the inherent worth and dignity of the Black lineage as a valued part of our Unitarian Universalist history. Okay, come on. Move. <laughs> there we go. 1785, Gloucester Dalton is one of the 85 signatories of the Charter of Compact of Gloucester Universalist Society, founded by Reverend John Murray. And I'm reading these aloud because not everyone sees screens perfectly and this way you both, you get both. In 18, from 1825 to eight, I think that should say 1911, sorry, Francis Seldon Watkins Harper was a member of the first Unitarian Church of Philadelphia. She helped to organize and found the NAACP. She was also a poet and uh, last year, I believe I read some of her poetry for y'all. In 1889, Joseph Jordan the first, was the first ordained African-American universalist minister. And he started a mission in Norfolk, Virginia. In 1893, he delivered an address entitled, Our Mission Among Colored People to the Universe General Convention in Washington, DC. The, sorry, the screen's in my way. The DC, the delegates contributed more than $2,600 to finance construction of a chapel in Norfolk, Virginia. And when I did the math last night, it converted to about $70,000 in today's dollars. This gentleman you may have heard of, 1908, Lewis Latimer, is an African American inventor and is a founding member of the Flushing Unitarian Church. He was an American inventor and patent draftsman for the patent of the incandescent light bulb and you thought it was Edison. Among other inventions, uh, uh, as, as, and uh, the light bulb as among other inventions. His house is located near the Latimer projects in his home, um, which was in Flushing, Queens. Ethel Red Brown moved to Harlem founded the community church there in 1920. It is now, I believe, known as the Abyssinian, the Abyssinian Church, but I may have that wrong. I'm gonna let you read. Brown declared religion is not an opiate but a stimulant, an incentive to noble deeds and a sustaining power in the house of crisis, in our hour of crisis. So not all our history is perfect. In 1927, William Carter founded a church of the Unitarian Brotherhood in Cincinnati. But the local ministers knew about him and didn't tell the AUA. That uh, was history was not really recognized until 1998 when it came to light and you may want to look that up for future reference it's just one example of 
this sort of thing that happened in our history. Lewis McGee was told if you want to be a Unitarian, you'd need to bring your own church. And then in 1947, he founded the Interfaith Interracial Free Religious Fellowship in Chicago and in 61 became the minister of the Chico Unitarian Fellowship in California. He is the first African-American senior minister in a white congregation. In 1927, Errol D. Collymore integrates the White Plains Unitarian Church and later became its president. David Eaton was refused entrance to St. Lawrence Univers Universal the Theological School, but later in 69, he's called to All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. Henry Hampton works for the UUA as assistant director and later um, was part of the Eyes in the, of the, on the Prize project by PBS on civil rights movement. Wade McGree serves as vice moderator of the UUA. Yvonne Sean, first American, African American woman to be fellowshipped in the UUA in 1981. And then Reverend Sinkford served as the first African American president of the Unitarian Universalist Association from 2001 to 2009. And in 2017, he was appointed the, one of the interims of a three interim panel after Peter Morales resigned. And most recently, Alandria Williams, who just recently passed away in October, served as co-moderator of the Unitarian Universalist Association alongside Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve from August 2000, so let's say 17, your cases are in its way, to 2020. Thank you for sharing this moment with us and recognizing the value of the Black community that has informed our denomination. Let me also note that, and thank you, Anne, for commenting on the, on the apology to the Carter family. I wanted to mention that. Thank you, Judith, for that walk through uh, Black Unitarian history. Uh, it is now that moment for interlude and offering. Uh, each Sunday, we share a portion of our plate uh, to social justice organizations, such as uh, selected by the SAC committee. I don't know if we have a specific name today that we can identify. Uh, but uh, you were urged to make your contribution either as you see on the screen through the um, uh, website or uh, I'm sort of old fashioned, one of the ancients. That's what we're talking about today, isn't it? And uh, so I mail mine in each month, but we urge you to uh, assist in any way that you can. So, so Barry, the 40% the will go to Second Harvest and this will be the last um, the last Sunday for that. Wonderful. Kelly, thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. I can't think of a better uh, uh, category to make that uh, contribution. <laughs> presentation today 
as we see on our screen, the miracle of our existence. And an opening statement for that is, you are here because of the chance encounter of all of your ancestors, mothers, fathers, that produced unique individuals generation after generation, eventually resulting in you. If we look far enough back into our family trees, we find that we are all cousins, but the paths of our ancestors were varied in so many ways. Let's look at what it means to remember our ancestors and how to honor them. Margie Espayat is a member of our University Unitarian Universalist Fellowship family and currently serves as our membership chair. Margie. Thank you, good morning. And thank you for letting me speak to you today about our ancestors and how we think about them and remember them and honor them. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is a big name in Buddhist monkery. And he uh, talks about looking at his hand and imagining all of his ancestors that lived through him. And quote, he says, look at this hand. You will say that this is my hand, right, but not enough. This is also the hand of my mother. This is also the hand of my father. This is the hand of my ancestor. Remember when you were a small child, you had a fever and your mother came and she put her hand on your forehead and it felt so good. Your mother may have passed away and you remember that lovely gentle hand and you miss it. Still, if you look deeply into your own hand, you see this is also your mother's hand. So the hand of your mother is still available at any time. The hand of your father, the hand of your ancestors is always available because your hand is there. Many of us have a fascination with the past and what our ancestors were like, how they lived and what they experienced. Think a moment about how you got here on, on earth. Your two parents of all the people alive needed to meet. And so did your four grandparents. And so did your eight great, great grandparents. You are a miracle. There are a few too many miracles on earth right now. We need to take it back a step and uh, stop producing so many, but we are miracles uh, nonetheless. So in remembering these ancestors, millennia ago, all people had were oral histories. They were pretty good at them, uh, but uh, that was limited, uh, limited by memory. Uh, then relatively recently in the historical timeline of humanity, widespread literacy became common and our ancestors could leave written records behind. Then starting in the mid 1800s, which is just a blip on the timeline of humanity, photography came into being and many of our great greats had portraits taken. And now we can see what they look like and how they dressed. Uh, but so many have been forgotten. When our light goes out or our hard drive stops, if, that, if you see life the way I do, uh, what remains are the memories of those still alive. And as the generations pass, those memories die too. Um, I recently read that it's common in Judaism to believe that no one is gone until the last person has forgotten them and no longer says their name. So I came up across a post on Reddit. I spent too much time on Reddit. And this is the genealogy subreddit, which is a great place to get lost in. Uh, in any case, uh, there's a Redditor. Those are the, what we call people who post on Reddit and they are anonymous. But this 
Redditor uh, made a project for himself. I don't know, it could have, might be a woman, I don't know, but I'm just gonna call him himself. He made a project for himself of reconstructing lives of individuals who died in the Holocaust, but have no survivors or anyone who remembers them. And I know there are databases devoted to this like Yad Vashem, but this person is taking it a step further. His only criteria is that the person he chooses have no existing memorial and appears to have no family to remember him. And he chooses them at random. So his first memorial uh, is to a Jacob van Os of Antwerp, Belgium. The amount of information he was able to come up with is wonderful and sad and sobering and well worth a read. And I am going to hopefully seamlessly here um, try to show you some, do a screen share and show you a photo of him. Here we go, do that. Uh, here he is, Jacob. He was born in 1876 uh, to parents who had been born in Amsterdam. His parents, uh, his father was a hat maker. And then later in life, he, uh, his father and he went into diamond cutting and moved to Antwerp. Uh, when he was 30 years old, he married Esther. Uh, let's see if we can. And there's Esther. Uh, they were married for 35 years until she passed away uh, in her 50s uh, in 1939. And uh, stop share. Just a moment. Here we go. Okay. Uh, she died in 1939 before anyone knew what would happen very soon to the Jews across Europe. Jakob died at Auschwitz in one of the largest um, uh, groups taken there. And um, his, uh, the man that came up with the memorials, not quite sure, can't find an exact record of his death, but based on his age and the statistics, he, he imagines that he was gassed very soon after her, his arrival. Um, I later, I'm going to post, a, when I'm done with this, I can't do this all at the same time, I'm not that talented, but I will post a link to his memorial in the chat. It's well worth a, a read. So for those of you who haven't delved into hunting for your ancestors' records or someone else's, we're going to look at how easy it can be these days. Um, FamilySearch.org is my favorite place uh, to search for American records. It's run by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Their site is fantastic and free and open to the public, no strings attached. No young men wearing ties and riding bikes are going to come knock at your door because you use the services. As of this month, there are 5.7 billion digital images on their website, including digitized books, microfilm, and other records. So I use spend most of my research time on this site and others too. But, um, and then I use wicketry.com to record the information I find. Uh, I highly recommend Wicketry. It's a free collaborative worldwide family tree with the mission of growing an accurate single family tree that connects us all and is freely available to us all. Uh, anyway, back to family search. So I wanted to pick someone I had no information on to use as an example. So I went to the Wikipedia page on the Okoe massacre of 1920, and here's an excerpt. Mose Norman, a prosperous African-American farmer tried to vote but was turned away twice on election day. Norman was among those working on the voter drive. A white mob surrounded the home of Julius Perry where Norman was thought to have taken refuge. After Perry drove away the white mob with gunshots, killing two men and wounding one who tried to break into his house, the
The mob called for reinforcements from Orlando and Orange County. The whites laid waste to the African-American community in Northern Ocoee and eventually killed Perry. I'm gonna skip the gruesome details. Anyway, it says Norman escaped never to be found. So let's see if we can find Moe's Norman. All right. Share screen. Okay, here, hold on just, oh, there we are, boom. Okay, this is the opening page the, of uh, homepage for Family Search. So let's, uh, I'm already logged in, so we're going to search records and we're going to look for Moe's, come on now. Mose Norman. We're going to skip birthplace because we don't know where he was born. We don't know when he was born, birth year. But we do know we're looking at the United States. So let's fill in country. And we'll populate there. And we're looking in Florida. Let's spell it correctly. There it is, Florida. We'll say match all terms exactly, but then we're gonna come back up here because Moe's, uh, I'm thinking, I'm imagining it could show up as Moses. So let's uncheck that one. So we'll get Moe's or Moses and let's do a search. So we're looking for people in Okoe. So we have a bunch of hits here, some Mo's, uh, some Moses, and here are some censuses, or are they sensi? Uh, marriages, deaths, all right. And here's the locations of uh, where these documents were uh, appeared. St. Petersburg, Fen Holloway, let's look for Okoe, let's scroll down. Well, here we are. We have a Moses, it's Moses Norman, shows up in 1910. I don't see any other Okoe's, but in two censuses, 1910 and 1920. Well, we've got a problem here uh, already. He's born in South Carolina here, but Georgia here. And in this census, he's born in 1871. In this census, he's born in 1861. You will find that kind of stuff a lot. Uh, let's go ahead and look at, let's look at the 1920 census. All right, here's the data, the basic data that you're going to find for Moses Norman. Uh, male, 49, says he's single. He's black, so that's more li very likely to be him. Uh, we don't know how many Mose Normans would have lived in Okoye at the time. Uh, but he's the only one that pops up. Let's look at the actual document here and see if we can find any clues here. All right, we're gonna zoom in so we can see a little better. Scroll, scroll over here and we're looking for, you know, uh, a lot of younger people can't read cursive anymore, um, but most of us can, so. Not like this is difficult to read in any case. Okay, we're looking for the last name of Norman. Aha, but look at this, Julius Perry, the, the home where Mose Norman took refuge. So that, uh, that seems like we're, the clues are bringing us, tightening this up, making us realize this is the same Mose Norman. Here he is down here, a couple of houses down the street. Moses Norman, head of the house. Uh, there's no one following him under head of the house. That means he's living alone. Um, single black male, 49. Okay. Um, let me get out of here. I'm going to stop sharing. And... Okay, um, 
spoiler alert, I've gone through all of these records, of course, before I showed up this morning to talk about this. And I went through these and looked at compared, looked at all the details. And, and this is why this can come become such a black hole of time uh, because there's so much you can see and find on here. But um, regarding those two different uh, entries for Moses Norman or Mose Norman, um, you have to, in both, in one of the entries, the other entry taken in 1910, he is listed as a messmate uh, in someone else's home. So think about why there would be these discrepancies in the information from 1910 to 1920. Well, you'll find this kind of thing often. I think I already said that. Um, but imagine a white census taker going through the neighborhood and he knocks on the door and his roommate answers and is trying to answer the questions about Mose Norman. Well, he's not sure if he, where he was born. So he guesses, you know, thinks it might've been Georgia. That's how we get these, uh, there are so, you can only, there are so many reasons it could be different, but um, let's see here. Um, I went on to search for taking these clues that I got in these censuses. I went on to search for him, uh, born in South Carolina. And I found a death certificate for his son, Herbert Lee, who was born in 1900 in Longwood and died of tuberculosis at the age of 23 and buried in Winter Park. It, the, Death certificate for his son includes his mother's maiden name, Eliza Merritt. And although their son, Herbert, was single, the informant was Birdie Angeline Norman, who I guessed may have been a sister. And sure enough, searching for Herbert Norman, I found that while his father was in Ocoee in 1910, he, the, the family, his sister, mother, and he are listed as living in Longwood. So what happened to them after the massacre? Uh, I did some Googling and found an article uh, outside of family search in the Orlando Weekly. Uh, a couple of years, the, the article's a couple of years old uh, about the Okoe massacre. And there's a document showing uh, Mose and Eliza, now residents of New York City, in 1921, a year after the massacre, in a contract where they're selling five and a half acres uh, in Okoe for $100 with the buyers taking over a $1,500 mortgage. The only other trace I can find of them is Eliza Norman's death certificate that shows her living in Manhattan at the time of her death in 1943 and she's listed as a widow. Their daughter Birdie shows up in a marriage certificate for her, for her daughter, Avi, that would be Moses' granddaughter, who was married in 1936 in Bradford, Florida. Uh, that's between here and Tampa. Um, and she was born in Highland, Florida. So here I've given you a couple of examples of very significant lives. They just happen to be two men who were victims of ethnic cleansing. And I wanted to show these two to emphasize one, the honor we can show to those who have passed and also honoring those who had no power in life or little to no power in life. And these were extreme cases. So back to why are some of us so determined to find more about our ancestors? Many researching their backgrounds take pride in finding famous and powerful great, 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 great grandfathers. And most of us, if we look long enough, we'll find some in our trees. But the truth is most of our ancestors were poor farmers who eked out a hard living but uh, their lives were full of drama and love and happiness and tragedy and sometimes adventure. Uh, one Redditor in the genealogy subreddit commented about why she was so into genealogy and she said, 
it has helped me a lot with positive self-talk. When I see what the women in my family endured through the years, I know I can handle all this crap that has been thrown at me, uh, end quote. So my great, great grandmother, I'm gonna show you my great, great grandmother. Here she is. That's Joanna Carey, ah, Clary, sorry, Joanna Clary, born in 1837 in County Kerry in Ireland. Um, that's her husband, Thomas. She immigrated uh, to Connecticut. I'm not sure when, I haven't been able to find any um, documentation on that. She was illiterate according to the census, uh, one of the censuses she appears in. And she had nine children and she died at the age of 40 after the birth of her uh, last child. Um, and she had nine children and she died with nothing written or remembered about her and her husband. Uh, I can only imagine what those lives were like. This photo I have uh, that you saw there is an amber type, which is a photograph made on glass. And it's just a couple of inches high. And about 25 years ago in one of our, my family's many moves, it was broken. And I was just devastated that after so many years, it was broken in my keeping. And I packed it up in a box and put it away in a closet. And I brought it out about five years ago and I took it over to Harmon Photo in Winter Park. They put it together as well as they could and uh, made a copy of it for me. And then some kind person, back to Reddit again, some kind Redditor under, um, oh shoot, what is it? What's those uh, programs where you Photoshop? Under the Photoshop subreddit, took out all the cracks and the lines. There was a crack right across that baby's face that I couldn't, and anyway, some kind person fixed it for me. So now I have it eight by 10 and I've sent copies to my uh, cousins that I can find that are also descended from that couple. So um, we've all heard the recommendations uh, to find your oldest aunt or other relative full of stories and record them. And if we were in person right now, sitting in our sanctuary, we'd look around at ourselves and acknowledge that a lot of us are those people now that need to make those recordings. We are the matriarchs and the patriarchs. I saw a quote, every time an old person dies, it is as if a library burns down. I know age is only a number, but uh, any, anyway, uh, as far as telling stories to younger family members, for those of you who are doing it, I, sometimes it seems like no one is listening. And then you start thinking that you're just droning on into the void, but keep on droning. Some of my favorite stories I've heard are simple things like how grandpa, had a rope tied from the house to the barn in Iowa so that during heavy snows, he could get out and milk the cows and not get lost on the way back. And I grew up in Imperial Beach in California and the idea of getting lost in the snow was incomprehensible to me as a child. But anyway, uh, an, or another story from my family is how my great, great, great grandfather told a soldier returning home to Ohio from the Civil War that he could take his pick of his five daughters. And my great-great-grandfather, Jeremiah, chose my great-great-grandmother, Elizabeth, but she was not happy. It seemed, she seemed, no, no, he seemed like an old man to her. Although they were both still in their 20s, um, I imagine him serving in the war may have aged him. Anyhow, they didn't seem unhappy and they went on to have four children. So there's a niece or nephew or grandchild out there who will care and will appreciate your efforts.
tell your stories and tell the stories you remember about your grandparents. And if you are the lucky one to have inherited photos and letters like I have, scan them and share them with as many cousins as you can. Your great great didn't pass down these letters and share them just for, just for one person to read them. Um, and there are a few very effective ways to do, to share these documents you might have. Google Drive is my favorite. I scan things, put them on a Google Drive, and then share them with relatives that I have contact with. So not many family stories are as tumultuous as, or interesting as Jacob van Oss's or Moe's Normans. In our families, <clears throat> we're more likely to come across people like Virginia Ransom, my great-great-grandmother's sister, born in Ohio in 1847. I know nothing about her other than when and where she was born and died. But I met a distant cousin on the telephone a few years ago, and this cousin is in Oklahoma. And she, we're both descended from the same great-great-grandmother. And she asked me if I knew who a Ginny Ransom was. And I explained to her that lady's relationship to the family. And she told me that in her family, coming down from her grandmother and her mother and her uncles and aunts, <clears throat> that during the last century, the 20th century, whenever they would travel, if they signed a log book in a hotel, they would also add Ginny Ransom because during her life, Ginny of all the family never got to go anywhere. She never married and ended up living with my great great grandmother as an old lady. So um, I'm gonna close with a, a quote from Della Cummings, who's a genealogist. She wrote this back in the 1940s. We are the chosen. In each family, there is someone who seems called to find the ancestors, to put flesh on their bones and make them alive again, to tell the family story and feel that somehow <clears throat> they know and approve. Doing genealogy is not a cold gathering of facts, but instead breathing life into all who have gone before. We are the storytellers of that tribe. Thanks. Thank you for listening. And now. Thank you so much, Margie. That was really good. I think many of us have uh, made some effort or have pe friends in our or, or members of our family who have made some effort. Uh, my great regret in looking at uh, those that have passed before me was that by the time I got really interested, they had all passed, particularly one person who had done so much work in, in, in the recent past. Uh, this this can be important to us individually, but also uh, it's been used on a uh, tribal or state level from time to time. It's, it's had some involvement in the uh, uh, Gilded Age uh, when people talked about eugenics and, uh, and it has uh, talks again today about, uh, you know, uh, how do we categorize the different races and that can be very troubling. Uh, there's a comment uh, by, and these will be the closing words, but uh, before that, I guess we should get to the uh, e extinguishing of the chalice. And so I'll hold those for a moment. <clears throat> Go to the extinguishing of the chalice. If you will join me in that and close your chalice, extinguish this chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And this music was selected by our speaker.
years of work and worry had left their mark behind. Thank you for sharing that song with us. I just, uh, that really uh, sort of a, puts a point right in the heart of the things that we're talking about this morning regarding our, our origins. And as I had said earlier, uh, origins uh, address the individual, but they also address the tribes and the states and the, and the larger groups. And uh, one thought by uh, a cultural psychologist uh, Stephen Hine has written that in every society that has been investigated, there is clear evidence to show that we are predisposed to think of the world as emerging from hidden underlying essences, whether that be blood or chi, the Chinese concept of energy, humors, or souls, and souls maybe also uh, DNA for some. Essentialism is one of the most persistent and widely documented psychological biases. So um, it, uh, it can mean so much, but we have to be cautious with it also. And those are my closing words. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the service today. I certainly did. And, and I wrote down those websites and I intend to uh, do a little work myself. Uh, with that, we will uh, close our service, and I invite everyone to uh, join in the postlude and to meet with their friends and to remove their mutes and to have a discussion, and I thank all of you for attending today. Thank you.